But President Trump, just back from his first international trip, is having a busy morning, doing what he appears to enjoy most, bashing the media. Maybe it's just pent-up frustration after remaining relatively quiet on social media and avoiding reporters on the nine-day trip. This morning's Twitter tirade ranges from leaks in the press to the Montana congressional election. Here's a sampling. It is my opinion, the president writes, that many of the leaks coming out of the White House are fabricated lies made up by the fake news media. And this, whenever you see the words sources say in the fake news media and they don't mention names, it is very possible that those sources don't exist but are made up by fake news writers. Fake news is the enemy. And this. Does anyone notice how the Montana congressional race was such a big deal to Dems and fake news until the Republican won? V was poorly covered. Well, that's what the president wrote this morning. Let's not forget that the president's lack of a single news conference with reporters on his nine-day trip was nothing short of unprecedented. The press corps traveling with the president was pretty much boxed out. It wasn't just the president. There were virtually no on-camera briefings or access to the major players, one exception. But does the week's lack of accessibility overall reflect a bunker mentality that's setting in amid the Russia investigations back in D.C.? And how will the media cover a president if they can't get to him? Well, I have the perfect panel to ask. Joining me now, Michael Oreskes, the head of news at NPR, former New York Times Washington bureau chief. He's got plenty of experience with this sort of thing. And April Ryan, White House correspondent and Washington bureau chief for the American Urban Radio Networks and a political analyst for CNN. So, Michael, let me start by asking you this. In pres previous presidential trips, the U.S. press was all over the president, and the president was all over the press and their top aides because they wanted to get this out. I mean, were you struck by how different this tone was? Yeah, we, we actually uh, hunted around to see if we could find a previous trip by any president of either party, uh, and we really couldn't. This is quite unusual. You've got to ask yourself the question of whether it's even serving his interests. It certainly doesn't seem to me to be serving the public interest in terms of understanding the president's points of view and positions. Uh, the whole administration, from tweets to uh, lack of public access to things like press conferences, seems to be all about trying to keep control of a message that's rapidly slipping out of their hands. April, we're all about data these days, so we did a little data digging on this to see just how this measures up. And CNN White House producer Allison Malloy tallied the president's interaction with the press corps on the trip. And here's what she found. There were 25 public appearances, many of them in sort of pool environments. Pool reporters asked five questions. The president answered two questions, no news conferences. How did it break down? The president addressed a question about classified intelligence with a Russian in a 12-second soundbite, reflected on his meeting with the Pope for 17 seconds for a grand total of 29 seconds of responding to questions over a nine-day trip. What do you make of it? Well, you know, this is a president who just does not uh, necessarily care for the press. And you can see that, Frank, in the tweets this morning. Um, this president is really trying to figure out how to deal with the press. And I think that's some of what we saw in these last nine days. It is unheard of to go overseas for nine days with the president of the United States and have the press corps there, the first line of questioning an American president, and not take formal questions or even, you know, really engage in... Um, these Q&As doing pool sprays. And, you know, we understand, and I know the president doesn't like this, but sources very close to what's happening inside the Republican Party uh, working with the RNC are saying things like, you know, when uh, we start seeing the day-to-day -day operations back here again, maybe uh, tomorrow, or not tomorrow, but Tuesday or so after the holiday, they're, they're really trying to figure out how to grapple with the press. They're trying to figure out what Sean Spicer's role will be. They're trying to figure out what to do with the briefings. They're also dealing with lawyers on issues of how they deliver statements or if they will indeed deliver statements because they're concerned about uh, issues if it's not accurate. Um, so, so, Frank, they are really trying to come to terms with how the president feels about the press, how they want to move forward. But the question is, what will the public do? Because if the public cries out, things can change. All right. Well, let me bring in you know, Tara Palmieri the, um, here. So, Michael, hang on one second for a second because I'd like to bring sure in Tara thing. Palmieri here. White House correspondent for Politico, also a CNN political analyst. She's been on the ground covering the president's first international trip. She's currently in Fermina, Italy. Uh, I want to ask you this. You know, I've, I've traveled with presidents, too, and it's not just about making the press feel good here, Tara. It's about 
as I said earlier, getting the word out back mm -hmm. to the United States to try to s set right. the frame for the story here, but also communicating to the world and projecting mm -hmm. through that presence a certain leadership. How was this being uh, dealt with on the ground there? And when you were pressing White House officials for more access, what were they saying to you? It was actually very difficult to get access to even the White House officials, let alone the president. We were asking um, questions, and they were putting us off until another briefing, another briefing. And, and the truth is, is that we were, we were trying to get more information, but we had very few opportunities. I, at one point, grabbed Gary Cohn, um, chief Ep economic advisor, on the side of a, of a, pool, or a pool event, and I just asked him some questions and sent it over to my colleagues, and they seemed really thankful. Um, I think the thing is that Trump really kept his press aides in the dark. I saw in uh, the meeting with uh, EU Council President uh, Donald Tusk and EU Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker, they had their spokespeople with them. President Trump did not have a single person from the press office in the meeting with him. So after the meeting, the first people to get the word out on what happened were the European Commission and the European Council. We waited more than four hours to get any details, not even background, on what went down in that meeting. Hours later, the German press broke a story saying that Trump had said that the Germans were very bad. And it was misconstrued in a way because obviously there was, you know, translation issues. And really, I just felt that the, the Americans, they didn't really, they weren't able to use the event to really push their message at home because the foreign officials, they were able to get the message to us first. Okay, I want to come back to, to Michael, to you, but I want to come back this way. CNN Sarah Murray asked the president's top uh, economic advisor, Gary Cohn, who was just mentioned, if he thought it was, quote, bizarre for the president not to take questions on the trip. Now, there were no cameras in the room because uh, Sean Spicer had turned the cameras, told everybody to turn the cameras off. <clears throat> there was audio. Here's his response. He's got a robust schedule. Publicly, he's put in 16, 18 hour days. Privately, he's put in 20 hour days preparing for those days. Yet he has worked nonstop since he has got here. Michael Oreskes, is your response? This is not about the president's schedule. This president has made a profound and fundamental break with most of his predecessors, probably all of his predecessors. You know, Frank, you and I have both been at this for a long time. And presidents of both parties agreed on two things. One is that a free and independent press is a royal pain. And the other is that it's an absolute necessity for a free and independent country. Uh, the best statement ever made about this was actually made by a Republican president on an international trip. And that was by Ronald Reagan when he spoke at Moscow State University about the power of American democracy. And he described the importance to freedom in America of the cacophony of independent news organizations, independently owned, independently run, and how that made this a freer country and how it protected the rights of individual Americans. This president has obviously decided on a different course. He's trying to stay as far as he can from journalism and from uh, independent news organizations, and he's trying to channel his message through the, the tools that he has, such as Twitter. It's April, different. I want to come, I wanna come We're going to live with it. We, well, we're going to have to live with it. We have to live with it, right? But the <laughs> question is, where is this going? And April, I know you interact with Sean Spicer at the White House uh, on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. We're now hearing the White House talk, as you mentioned, about possibly curtailing, canceling, mm -hmm. limiting briefings, uh, rotating different people through briefings. What is brewing here and why? Yeah. Well, Frank, as you know, um, this is not, and, and, and yes, we are, the freedom of the press, the First Amendment, we are baked into the Constitution. But people have to understand, when you talk about freedom of the press, it's not just about us, it's more about you. It's not about us. It's about the American public. And we are the first line of questioning of an American president. And with the stakes being so high right now, with investigations, issues of terror around the world, um, budgets and, and ACA, the wall, so many different things going on, people want to know what What's going on from the highest office in the land and when you cut off the briefings when you just tweet people are not being informed and what happens is and, and, and I hate to say this but if you start doing this what makes us different than Russia or or other 
countries that censor the press and it's state run. So there is a real issue here. It's not about the press. And yes, the president doesn't like us. He calls us fake news all day long. That's fine. But the issue is, is that we are independent and we're independent of the White House. And when you don't give the information, who suffers the American people because they don't know what's going on from the man that they elected? So that's what's at stake. Tara Palmer, let me come back to you. Um, having been on these trips and knowing that when all White Houses try to spin information or put people out on background or whatever, right. there is almost always mm -hmm. a protest, formal or informal, in the room or behind the scenes from the journalists covering the story. Were there protests on this trip to White House officials, to Sean Spicer, he's still the press secretary, to others, to change access right. to the traveling party, and what was the formal and informal response? Absolutely. The White House Correspondents Association made their case known. I don't, if, if you follow the pool reports, we often made it clear that we would not be getting much access, and we tried to make it clear as well to uh, Sean Spicer. I think a lot of people were really upset when they saw that Secretary of State Rex Tillerson gave a briefing to Saudi Arabian journalists, and American journalists were not invited to that. I think you saw that there weren't enough, there wasn't enough access to high-ranking officials. But at the end of the day, towards the end of the trip, after they were able to make their case known about day seven, we started getting access every single day to higher-ranking officials. But of course, they were going to be bombarded with questions at home. And they said, you know, we can't comment on this. We have to talk about the trip. We have to talk about the trip. But the the issues at home, they reflected what was happening on the trip. And, and it was really something that, you know, Trump had this robust schedule, but he could have made time to talk to the press. This is very unprecedented for a president not to talk to the press on his trip. And, and they would have been more effective at really telling the American people what exactly Trump was doing, because all they can see are images and all they can read are stories and they don't hear the president's voice. This was less about trying to set the, the, the storyline for where they were and as opposed to avoiding the storyline from where they'd come from in the investigation. Exactly. That were going it was on. exactly about that. All right. Well, thank you very much. April right. and Tara, thanks so they much. They thought it Michael. was a way to, get to ignore it. <laughs> well, or to try for the time being.